Hey friends, one of my favorite scenes from one of my favorite movies is the bridge of death scene from Monty Python's Holy Grail. If you aren't familiar, it's worth the watch. You know, you can pause right now and do a quick YouTube search to get you there, but let me paint the scene for you. Uh, the Knights of the Round Table are with King Arthur in search of the Grail. And they come across the bridge of death, which is suspended over the gorge of eternal peril. And they must answer the bridge keeper's three questions to gain access to the other side. So Sir Lancelot, he's the first, first to approach. And then he hears the bridge keeper speak. He says, stop. Who would cross the bridge of death, death must answer me these questions three. Ere the other side, he see. Lancelot responds, ask me the questions, bridge keeper. I'm not afraid. The bridge keeper says, what is your name? My name is Sir Lancelot of Camelot. What is your quest? To seek the Holy Grail. What is your favorite color? Blue, says Lancelot. Right, off you go, says the bridge keeper. Oh, oh, thank you very much, says Lancelot. Now Sir Robin, who had been cowering in fear before, sees how easy the questions were and he approaches. First two questions were the same. What's your name? What's your quest? But the third question is, what is the capital of Assyria? Robin doesn't know the answer and is cast into the gorge. The rest of the scene is pretty hilarious. I don't want to spoil it. You should go back and watch it. You could probably watch the whole movie if you've never seen uh, Monty Python's Holy Grail. It's a classic comedy piece. Uh, but it was this scene that came to mind when I was thinking about this morning's message, thinking about the questions that come to us, especially when we read the Bible. I feel like we've all been in a situation where the questions that come, the answers seem relatively easy. Like, what's your favorite color? What's, you know, what's your name? What's your quest? Like, they're, they're, they're not that difficult to answer. But until suddenly they're not, we're caught off guard with what's the capital of Assyria. You know, like, we may not be tossed into the gorge of eternal peril, but it seems like, at least for me, when we get into scripture, that if we answer the questions incorrectly, there may be some dire consequences. Consequences. Like, when we approach scripture for the first time, or certainly for the first time as an adult, there may be some bumps in the road, right? There may be some passages that we're like, oh, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do with this passage. But we have found our ways over or around them. Like Genesis 1 and 2, the fact that there are two different creation accounts. You know, that can cause a little bit of consternation for some of us when we read it. We're like, wait, how is the order different? And what's, you know, it's, it's yeah, like things don't match up perfectly. Now, there's ways of getting around the awkward timelines, and I'm sure you've heard some of those arguments. But then you roll into the next chapter, and there's a talking snake. Now, okay, we maybe have to interpret this in a way that we haven't, like, stepped into Narnia, where there's a literal talking snake. But then the next chapter has a, a, about, a chapter about murder. The very first, like, things get dark in a hurry in the Bible. And everything is off the rails by the time we get to chapter 5. And that's then when we read about this flood and this subsequent rainbow. And this, for many, is where questions start to abound. Like when you start digging a little deeper into the story of the Bible, and especially into the story of the flood, you know, our first questions might be about like logistics. Like how did he actually fit two of every kind of animal? And why didn't the carnivores just eat every, uh, everything on the boat? And like, why did he bother saving mosquitoes? Like, you know, there's, there's questions like that that come to us, but then the questions start getting a little bit more serious and maybe a little darker. Like, how did this become a children's story? How do we have paintings of these things on our, on our you know, nursery walls? It's like, if you actually look at this story, literally everyone drowns. I mean, everyone except Noah's family. Like, for, like, for my money, that's one of the most terrifying ways to die. But we read about the like, complete destruction of nearly the entire human race. How is this not a horror film? And the questions that we may ask maybe seem a little sacrilegious. There might be some of you who are watching right now and they're like, oh, like, I'm uncomfortable with asking some of those questions. Maybe we're not even supposed to ask them. Maybe we're just supposed to, you know, kind of skim over those stories and go like, well, I'm not sure exactly how that all works out, but uh, I'll find out the answers um, when I get to heaven. You know, the, or when we're asking those questions, we're somehow revealing our lack of faith or our lack of trust in the Bible. But what if God's okay with us asking our questions? What if, in fact, we are invited to wrestle with it? What if that's part of walking out a life of faith? What if that's actually integral to us being people who honestly uh, follow God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength? What if we're invited to ask why? What if the Bible itself is riddled with questions, with people questioning, with trying to figure out 
who this great God is and what he wants from us. Because the questions are unavoidable. At least they have been for me. I like what Pete Enns has to say near the beginning of the Bible tells me so, uh, why defending scripture has made, it una- made us unable to read it. He says, when you read the Bible on its own terms, you discover that it doesn't behave itself like a holy rule book should. It is definitely inspiring and uplifting. It wouldn't have the shelf life it does otherwise. But just as often, it is a challenging book that leaves you with more questions than answers. And I found that to be true. The the Bible tells me so, but what it tells me is not always all that clear at first glance. And today, today, today we come to what I imagine is the biggest hurdle most of us face when we're approaching the Bible on our own. It often leaves us with more questions than answers. Being an ancient book, there, there's some things that just seem to get lost in translation. Like we, we don't sacrifice animals anymore. What's with all the kings and the conquering? And what's, what's with all the bloodshed and the rules about what we can eat and can't wear? And like there are so many questions that come and there's so much distance between us and when the Bible was written. So how do we, how do we question? How do we wrestle? Because when I look at many of the writers and characters of the Bible, I see that they questioned, that they wrestled. It starts all the way back in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. They question whether or not they're really going to die if they eat the fruit. Cain and Abel, am I my brother's keeper? Abraham questioned, Isaac questioned, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, David, Elijah, Mary, John the Baptist, even Jesus himself, they all questioned. So we're in good company when we wrestle with, when we question the, the things that we come to understand, especially through the scriptures provided that our questions are pointing us in the right direction. I think our posture is a key element to this aspect of engaging with the Bible. Because if our desire is to just tear the Bible down, to prove that it's irrelevant, then we're likely going to find some passages that will relegate it to the distant past. You know, that it's no longer worthy our time or our study. And if we're looking to nitpick about dates and details, if we refuse the possibility of miracles, then there are hurdles that we probably won't get over with the Bible. And we will be tempted to just close it up and say, this thing just doesn't work for me anymore. But if our desire is to grow in wisdom, is to grow in faith, if wrestling with the text is something we're willing to do, it will lead us into a deeper relationship with the God who is behind that text. And that is what I believe the point of the Bible is. It's not to be the thing that we hold up as the fourth member of the Trinity. It's not equal to God, but it is a tool that we use to help us understand God. The point of the Bible is to lead us to wisdom, to draw us to Jesus. It is a tool, valuable and useful, yes, but it is still only a tool. I am far more interested in knowing Jesus than I am knowing every single line of the Bible. I want to know the God behind the Bible. I want to understand who this God is and how he speaks to my life today and how he does that through scripture, but also how he speaks to me through nature and through life experience, through prayer. I want to be in relationship with the God of the Bible. And I've found that the Bible is one of the best ways for me to get to know Jesus. Proverbs 3 contains a beautiful invitation into this life of wisdom um, that we seek and and what we find in the scripture. Proverbs 3 opens up with, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. I love that. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. A little further down, it continues. It says, blessed are those who find wisdom, who those who gain understanding. For she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She, she there is wisdom, wisdom personified as a female. She is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, and her left hand, in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Those who hold her fast will be blessed. So this is the, the path that we're on of discovering who God is, of, of, of gaining a heart of wisdom, of, of living a life of wisdom. But this wisdom does not come without some wrestling. 
In that same book, the Bible tells me so, Pete Enns writes this. I'm going to read a couple of short paragraphs. He says, the Bible isn't a cookbook. You know, deviate from the recipe and the souffle falls flat. It's not an owner's manual with detailed and complicated step-by-step instructions for using your brand new all-in-one photocopier, fax machine, scanner, microwave, DVR, home security system. It's not a legal contract, you know, make sure you read the fine print and follow every word or get ready to be cast into the dungeon. It's not a manual of assembly, like leave out a few bolts and the entire jungle gym collapses on your three-year-old. When we open the Bible and read it, we are eavesdropping on an ancient spiritual journey. That journey was recorded over a thousand year span of time by different writers with different personalities at different times under different circumstances and for different reasons. In the Bible, we read of encounters with God by ancient peoples in their times and places, asking their questions and expressed in a language and ideas familiar to them. Those encounters with God were, I believe, genuine, authentic, and real, but they were also ancient. And that explains why the Bible behaves the way it does. This kind of Bible, the Bible we have, just doesn't work well as a point-by-point, exhaustive and timeless binding list of instructions about God and the life of faith. But it does work as a model for our own spiritual journey and an inspired model, in fact. This is why the Bible is worth reading, not a sanitized and artificially well-behaved version that tells you what to do and think on every line, but the diverse, inconsistent, messy, and sometimes bizarre one that we have. This Bible, which preserves ancient journeys of faith, models for us our own journeys. We recognize something of ourselves in the struggles, joys, triumphs, confusions, and despairs expressed by the biblical writers. Rather than a rule book, and we seriously have to switch metaphors here, the Bible is more a land we get to know by hiking through it and exploring its many paths and terrains. This land is both inviting and inspiring, but also unfamiliar, odd, and at some points unsettling, even risky and precarious. I believe God encourages us to explore this land, all of it, patiently, with discipline, in community, and above all with a sense that we, joining the long line of those who have gone before, will come to know ourselves better and God more deeply by accepting that challenge. Sorry for reading such a long passage, but Pete says it so well. I started taking the Bible far more seriously when I stopped treating it like an instruction manual or a rule book to follow. When I started digging deeper, when I started asking better questions, like really wrestling with the text, it came far more alive to me when I, than when I thought I had to have all of the answers sorted out. When I looked at it more as a, uh, a place to explore, a land to uncover and to walk my way through, to be a part of this journey, it led me to more wisdom. It led me to more fascination with the kingdom that God is building. It led me into a deeper relationship with the God of the Bible. When we like when the Bible is able to say what it says and not what we want to try and impose on it. When I accepted that I have the Bible that God wants me to have and it doesn't behave all the time the way that I think it should. It's, it doesn't work as a rule book or a set of instructions. It's far more beautiful than that. And if you're someone who's been told to take the Bible literally, it can be really freeing to realize the Bible is far more nuanced and complex, that we don't need to defend or explain away apparent contradictions because none of us, none of us read it like a textbook or a cookbook or a rule book anyway. Like we all interpret and adjust things for our times. There are things that we uh, don't uh, engage with in the same way that the original authors would have. There are things that the Bible seems to accept or even condone that we no longer do. do. Like, I do not have 300 wives. I do not own slaves. None of us read the Bible literally, or at least we don't read all of it literally. We don't actually believe that God is our rock. He's not a physical rock. We understand that there are metaphors. We understand that there are similes. We understand that there are parables. Jesus is not literally a lamb or a lion or both. Now, those might be slightly ridiculous examples, but for For those who want to hold up the Bible as a textbook or a a book of super accurate history or a science book, if you're, you know, trying to match up, you know, archaeological finds and all of those things and and try and prove that from scripture, you're going to run into issues really quickly. And the mental gymnastics you have to engage in to explain away the apparent contradictions are pretty far-fetched because the Bible was never intended to be those things. That's our modern mindset that we're trying to impose back on an ancient text. 
the first writers were not concerned with super accurate dates. They weren't concerned with, you know, making sure that it lines up with modern scientific understanding of the way DNA and um, atoms and micro, like quantum physics, we don't have all of that in this ancient text. And when we try to impose those things, we run into trouble. And the explanations that we come up with probably don't hold the water that we hope that they would. For people who think critically, those arguments don't, don't do a whole lot for us. But the good news is they don't have to. You can love the Bible. You can see it as the very word of God. You can see it as the inspired and authoritative word of God. You can cherish and honor and pour yourself into it without having to defend it as a textbook. It, it doesn't have to be an owner's manual or a rule book. No matter how much we might want it to be, it does contain rules that will help us in our life. It does contain ways of understanding who God is, but that's not what the Bible is. I often use Proverbs 26 verses 4 and 5 to illustrate how we can get turned around when we try to just hold a literal view of scripture and treat it like a textbook or a rule book that we have to follow. Proverbs 26 verse 4 says, do not answer a fool according to his folly or you yourself will be just like him. I've often quoted Mark Twain when I've read this passage and sometimes have even thought he sounds a lot like the author of the um, book of Proverbs. He says, never argue with an idiot. They will drag you down to their level and beat you with experience. Like, do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you or yourself will be just like him. You will become a fool. This is a good piece of advice. And Proverbs is full of great advice. Now, if this were the only verse you read on the subject, you'd be tempted to make a rule for yourself. I will never answer fools. God doesn't want me to answer fools. I will not argue with idiots. This is the rule. Now, it's one that I've been inclined to live as, live by as I disengage with some of the online activity and dialogue. No one has ever won uh, an argument or won somebody over by a meme or a Facebook post. So this is good advice. Never argue with an idiot. Never argue with a fool or you'll become just like them. But that's not everything the Bible has to say about answering fools. In fact, the very next verse, Proverbs 26 verse 5 says, answer a fool according to his folly or he will be wise in his own eyes. Now, if you only read this verse, not the one before, you might be tempted to comment on every post that you disagree with. You might be tempted to get up with, you know, at every sermon you thought was out of line and speak your mind. So the advice here seems to be, you need to always answer. You need to correct people. You need, if somebody is being wayward or foolish, you need to step up and say something. So when we put those two back to back in the same book of the Bible, it creates a bit of a contradiction. So which are we supposed to do? Which is the rule we're supposed to follow? Well, the answer is both. The answer is it depends. The answer is wisdom will help us discern whether this is an opportunity for us to be silent and not get engaged in a foolish argument. And this is, or that this is a time where we need to speak up and share the truth and help somebody understand the waywardness of their ways, that they might learn, that they might um, stop saying things that are foolish. The point is, sometimes it's wise to answer a fool, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's wise to keep silent, but sometimes it's not. And this is the journey of faith. This is how the Bible behaves. It invites us to question and to wrestle and to engage with it in such a way that we're like, in this particular moment, how could I be faithful to God? Like those who in the story were faithful. Or how might I be faithful to God because those in the story that I read about failed to be faithful to God? How might I live differently because of the example that I see in the text? The Bible takes more than just a quick glance. It's more than just a cursory reading. And this is where we have to dig into scripture. Where we have to think deeply about the meaning and the application. This is what it means to meditate. This is what it means to question and wrestle. Wrestling with scripture can be a deeply enriching spiritual practice. Asking questions and doubting doesn't necessarily lead us to a place of despair and like throwing the Bible out altogether. If our posture is towards uh, wisdom, is towards wanting to know God more, he will speak to us in the midst of our questions. So maybe you want to try it this week. Maybe you want to take a passage of scriptures. Try something short, something that either resonates with you or, or brings up a specific question or concern that you have, whether it's one verse or a few verses. Just with the time that you have available, find something that piques your curiosity and then 
read it slowly and attentively. Like pay attention to each word and phrase. Sometimes reading aloud will help you focus better, but read it over a few times and then ask some questions. Engage with the text. Ask like, what does this passage say about God? What, what am I learning about Jesus? Or what does this say about the Spirit? What does this passage, passage reveal about human nature or re relationships of the world? Is this something that seems like it's, you know, speaking to my modern uh, way of living right now? Or does this seem like something that was specific to a time and place and people? What's happening in the verse? What's happening in my heart as I read it? Am I, am I encouraged? Do I feel blessed? Do I feel like this is a promise that's being spoken into my heart? Or do I feel challenged? Do I feel confused? Do I feel like, oh, this doesn't seem like the God that I know and follow. This, this seems sort of out of character. Do I feel like I'm filled with hope and joy? Like, notice the details and ask some questions. And maybe I should interject something here. Like, I found it really helpful to not keep the questions to myself. Like to talk about it with friends who are also on the journey of knowing Jesus. Like we also live in an age where like information's at our fingertips. So like don't be scared to go looking for some of those answers. Like you can Google, hey, why does it say this in, you know, Judges chapter 4? Well, what's, what's the Bible, you know, what does it mean when it says this? And you'll find articles. Again, you got to use some discernment. But read other books that help us understand the Bible, commentaries, like uh, the book The Blue Parakeet by Scott McKnight was one of the first ones I read that really helped, an, helped open my eyes to um, reading scripture more widely and more broadly. Um, I found much of Pete N's stuff really helpful, but like ask questions because God will answer our questions, whether through study or by the Spirit. I, I believe God leads us into truth. We talked about it last week, that as we read, as we meditate, God speaks to our hearts that this, this book is not one that's just a, a book of fiction. This is a book that will speak now because the Spirit will use it to speak to us. You may remember at the Last Supper in John 15, Jesus was encouraging his disciples to remain in him. Like he was the vine, they were the branches. And he said, I'm going to send you an advocate. The Holy Spirit is going to come. It's good for you that I go away. And in chapter 16, he says, When he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. This is where we get out of the territory of just like mere study. Because as much as I love digging into the original languages and getting my arms around the context and the intricacies of the early church and the ancient Israelites, that's not the main purpose of the Bible. It's not the goal to make us into scholars of the Old and New Testament. The goal is to draw us deeper into relationship with God, is to make us more like the people of God. It's to make us into lovers of God and lovers of people, to, to be those who reveal the love of Christ in the world, who are being made into his image and likeness, who listen to his voice and follow his leading in their lives. And we're going to get into that next week. But if I'm not brought to a place where I love God or love my neighbor more, I'm missing the relationship aspect that this book is designed to help us develop, that these questions should lead us to a place where we love God and we love neighbors more. And that's what, that's what wisdom is. Wisdom is about knowledge in action. The ancient Hebrews didn't distinguish between knowing something and acting on it. They didn't need to say hear and obey. You prove that you heard something when you lived it out. And so we wrestle with the Bible. We ask our questions in the hopes that we might know the God behind the text more faithfully, that we might live out this life of faith. And that would be my hope for each one of us, that our, our questions lead us to take the text seriously, and that they lead us to curiosity rather than complacency, that we would seek to know the author of the text more than just the words on the page. We want to question and wrestle that we might gain a heart of wisdom, that we, when we engage with the text, we'd be more concerned with hearing God speak to us than sorting out all of the complexities. Not ignoring, not covering over, but wrestling with those complexities in order that we might continue to grow in wisdom and faith. That our relationship with the text would enrich our relationship with it and its creator. That by questioning, by wrestling, we'd meet the Spirit as he leads us into all truth. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful for the questions. 
Though they cause us some anxiety, they lead us into some uncharted territory, we know that they're the gateway to wisdom. They spark our curiosity. They take us you know, further up and farther in. And, and we want to know you. We want to we wanna obey your truth. We want to walk in your kingdom. So would you help us to continue wrestle with the text so that we meet you in the middle of it? Would our relationship with you not just be about being informed, but that we be transformed by our time spent in Scripture? Would you peek out of every page? Would you continue to draw us into deeper relationship with yourself through your word? For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks again for joining us for Church at Home. We, we have a couple events coming up in August and September we want to make you aware of. One, again, is our Young Adults and Not So Young Adults softball game. It's scheduled for a couple weeks from now, Sunday, August 18th. If you head over to the web, website, gracewinnipeg.ca, um, you can uh, register and sign up to play on either the Young Adults or Not So Young Adults team, or you can just sign up and say, I want to come and cheer. We'll have some uh, games and activities for the younger kids who aren't going to be playing baseball. So families, you can come as a whole family and we'll have stuff for the little ones there as well. We also want to make you aware of the uh, ladies retreat that's happening at Manhattan Beach on September 27th to 29th. Registration is now open on the website, so if you are one of the women of grace, you won't want to miss this weekend. It's a great time away down at Manhattan. Uh, you can register now and get your spot for that on September 27th to 29th. We hope you're enjoying this August long weekend and squeezing everything you can out of our all too short summer. And as you head into this new month and into your next week, may God's grace and mercy follow you wherever you go and whatever you do. May Jesus' teachings and redeeming love give you a disciplined holy life. May the Holy Spirit's presence give you joy in serving others and being light in this world's darkness. Go in peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace to you.